Thanks and hello everyone. Um, I'm Peter Stevenson. I work at the geomagnetism team at the British Geological Survey offices in Edinburgh. And geomagnetism as a science has been going for at least 180 years. And I'm going to present a perspective on how that long scientific history affects the people working in the field today. Um, but what is geomagnetism exactly? Well, the magnetic field of the Earth is generated primarily by a circulating liquid nickel iron core, which creates a magnetic dipole, which changes slowly over time. But uh, there's a much faster component of change due to the stream of charged particles that emanate from the sun, the solar wind. And it's the solar wind's interaction with the Earth's dipole that creates the magnetosphere and phenomenon like uh, polar auroral displays. And so in terms of pure science, then, this is a very interesting subject to study. Um, geomagnetism also provides practical applications, for instance, forecasting space weather and extreme space weather events are included in the UK government's National Risk Register, along with pandemics and terrorism, as it can cause hazards such as power outages and damages and damage to conductive in infrastructure like uh, railways and pipelines, as well as potential damage to spacecraft and avionics. Um, and a very long-standing use that geomagnetism has been put to is for orientation and navigation. A magnetic compass uh, points northwards, but not quite geographic north, and it's that not quite element that's important. And it might surprise you to know that you're still using a compass. It's embedded in your smartphone, um, and that uses the world magnetic model, which PGS also contributes to. Anyway, I've promised uh, a history, so we'll start near the beginning, and then we'll fast forward to the computer era, since we're drawing lessons for a software conference. So the earliest magnetic data that we have at PGS, you can see this online, is what's known as a yearbook. And this one here from the Royal Observatory at Greenwich from 1840 to 1841 contains both magnetical and meteorological observations. Um, now, at this time, an observer would record data directly from the instrument at, say, every hour on the hour, maybe with a notebook and pencil. Although a surprise to me was that Computers were employed at Greenwich from 1836. Um, a computer being a person whose job was to turn observational data into something more useful using long and tedious calculations, according to the Royal Observatory website. So um, very soon after the first few year, years of measurements, 1846, manual recording was replaced by continuous recording, drawing traces of variation on photographic paper, and uh, this one's from Kew, or the King's Observatory, uh, 1857. Of course, there's still plenty of work for the computers to do to transcribe the values from chart in order to uh, do calculations. So our data holdings at BGS go back a long time, scientific terms. Uh, and as well as that longevity, an extremely useful aspect of the time series data is that many data sets have been continuously recorded, and that's invaluable for recording trends over time. Um, just to illustrate continuity then, that's just a slide from one of our directories, folders named 1883 to 2022, nothing done yet this year. Um, and here's a snippet from various, very earliest data file that we could find our systems. This one's from 1883 at Parc saint in Paris and um, this shows geomagnetic recordings, a global endeavor. Um, but here's a data file we can use today, pop it in a pandas data frame, and we're all set. So which brings me to this. Um, so I'm going to fast forward now from early days of systematic recording to the computer era. Uh, in principle, not much changed in terms of data collection. Observatory instruments got better. Um, but we're still recording an analog trace of instrument variation. Um, computer aid, computational aids were, would be logarithmic tables, slide rules, mechanical calculators, perhaps. But let's check in what technology looked like in the 1960s. Um, and now from here, I'm indebted to a retired colleague, uh, John Riddick, who documented a 
history of the geomagnetism unit from 1960s to the 1990s. I'm going to sprinkle some quotes from John's memoir through the rest of this presentation. Um, and that's going to reinforce what's going to be a few themes, which are that history can and will repeat itself. Uh, the course of history is not easy to predict, and history has a kind of weight behind it, and it's only going to get longer and bigger. Um, so here's what John set up with that in the 1960s. So imagine this, kids, there's no internet. Um, postal service uh, acted as your network connection. You'd have to physically post your data on punch tape there. You had Fortran programming Hollerith cards in a little rubber band. Um, post that to the data center and then you wait for the results to come back on the postie's bicycle. Um, and here's some pictures of actual computers that, that John uh, documents being used. I've set them along a timeline. Um, and that also shows where our observatories, which are out around the world, um, they start to be linked up using advances in network connectivity, telephone and satellites, no more postman. And it's a new thing called the internet. Uh, computers talk to each other. And it's not just physical technologies that's moving on. Physical machines are making way for virtual machines, virtualized containers, and whole cloudy infrastructure that's floating about. It's not sat on your desk. Um, this is the GMAG progression through this sort of technology stack. And you see a similar progression in programming languages if you use these ever more sophisticated systems. And I'll see that in a long-term undertaking like this, then the technology accumulates over time. And the longer the time, the more the accumulation. And technology accelerates over time. Moore's law. So even though you might place your Perl scripts eventually in the same, same time frame, you might have acquired some new, for the sake of argument, Rust or whatever the new trend is. Um, so here's, here's John Reddick again, his view of the future around 1990. C is going to be the language preferred option for all future developers. Um, so now the other effect that's happening over this period is that people like John Reddick, they're scientists and engineers, they're, they're, um, they're learning technologies as they go along. They don't start out as programmers, they're certainly not software engineers. And fundamentally, the researchers just want to do research and a computer and software is just another tool to do that. Um, this discipline of software engineering or designing robust, efficient programs, it's also a historical process, one that didn't even exist when John started working. And the legacy of this um, help here is apt to engineering. Um, it's code that might have been written like this. So, uh, researcher writes code, yeah, copy the program to refer back to it. If it was wrong, uh, maybe put in some print statements to check some values, run it a few times with some different inputs, verify results of what they think. Write some code, comment lines, describing what the code does, uh, copy the program to the bin directory, and then move on to the next thing. So um, all, the, all these good practices that we learn as software engineers are are not necessarily the ones that researchers are, are going to learn. It's it's an overhead then. It's a, a nice to have. So when we as research software engineers come along and we inherit the responsibility for looking after the software and maybe the scientists who wrote the software are still using it and they're happy with it. What do we do about that? Um so as I see it, it's, it's just our job to to help, to educate, try and explain the benefit of doing things the right way or a better way, whatever that is. And we have people that we meet at these conferences, the software carpentry people, and um, you good folks that help improve skills and help us along with that. And then you get resistance, people don't want to change, that's a given. So often these improvements are seen as a cost without benefit. And maybe that's true sometimes. So maybe we don't need to be too dogmatic and an argument that here is why do we have to change things? The code's just the same. It's it's the logic is the same. It just does the same thing. Um, but the thing that does change uh, is the rest of the world, the, the environment in which the program lives that we track wrong. So some examples of what things change in the world um, that affects 
how software will sound now. Um, this is a thing. Um, and some UK government contracts that BGS provides have a stipulation that the contractor has to be certified for this thing, Cyber Essentials, and it's got a big cousin, Cyber Essentials Plus. And being certified for that means that all the systems and software of the organization should comply. And what does that mean in practice? It means uh, for us anyway, a continual process of scanning for security problems, updating machines, containers, software, and so on to address vulnerabilities. And uh, when this was first rolled out at BGS, we maybe have some applications that have been chugging away happily for 20 years in a little Java virtual machine, not harming anyone, it seemed, but a uh, threat to national security. Well, I exaggerate, but um, I tell you, it's uh, far from a stroll in the park. Let's walk through all fixing all these version updates, package dependencies. In fact, it might not be possible at all. Um, you know, third party libraries that were all the fashion five years ago, now unsupported, abandoned. So it's history at work again. And the longer you've been at it, the more of these venerable applications you have to deal with. And the older they are, the worse the dealing with it becomes. Uh, okay, another example of a changing world that software lives in. Um, with this state file I showed you earlier, this is a format called IAGA 2002. IAGA, so origins go back to 1873. And they have a parent organization, the IUGG, International Union of Geodesy and Geophysics. They were established in 1919. And they, these are the international bodies that promote and coordinate research. So this, the science like technology is also broadening its scope because you get new instruments and techniques, models and so on. New formats get described, older ones get modified, more general ones get adopted. So before 1996, there's, there's no such thing as XML, let alone JSON. These sort of generic formats that are widely adopted. Um, but if we have data in these older formats, we still want to be able to use it in the science. Now there's a nice piece of Python software. It's got a title called Magpie, which um, converts between geomagnetic formats. Some of them on this slide, but there's many more, 52 in fact. Um, and the software engineers need to be aware of this changing landscape and be able to deal with it, not just the new and shiny, but the old and cranky. Um, and it's not something that's unique to geomagnetism, we've heard um, previous speaker and other. Um, but my point is that over time, bigger and bigger effect of this, the weight of history. Um, a final, a final example of something that changes over time is what funding there is to do the work. Um, it seems to me, that although it's never easy to get funding, it's easier to get funding for new things, support the things that are happening now, than support things that are happening now as a consequence of the past. So what about all that stuff that started 180 years ago, but observatories are still in operation after a century. The work that's needed to do the changes that I've just talked about, to keep on doing the things that we've done, to keep on doing this continuous, uninterrupted monitoring Earth's magnetic field, to, to run, to stay still, as it were. Is there a pot of money from a generous benefactor? Rhetorical question. Um, this is John Riddick on the subject. But, so, ultimately, it, it's people that make history and the effects that I'm describing here are due to people usually doing the best they can to move forward with what technology allows them to do, what their organization expects of them. Often the high ranking superintendents of the world that get remembered in history, individuals in charge, eminent scientists, but there are always many people involved at any one time in research activities, teams of people. Uh, some people might work on a project for a short time, maybe an entire career. They might retire or leave to work elsewhere or come ill or die. And the, the loss of staff without a 
accumulated experience, knowledge and expertise could be a major inhibitor, inhibitor to continuity. Um, staff can be replaced, of course, but that wisdom of the ages is not something that's easy to replace. Wisdom of the ages is maybe not best illustrated by this picture. Um, and there's a psychological aspect to it as well. People form relationships and good relationships make good collaborations and successful research. There are so many aspects of influence of people on long running projects. But since we're here at the Software Engineering Conference, I'll just single out one in particular to finish with. Um, you'll all know these scenarios. Here's John Riddick again. Um, so when you're writing software, have a thought for those who come after you. Documentation, 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 not just your code or your get arounds, your ID setups, hints, hacks, and anything else that's going to uh, help the poor person come along behind you. Um, because you might think you're writing one time throwaway code, but um, from experience, that one time code can easily get amalgamated into some central crucial cog in the whole machine. And if no one knows how to make that cog, turn around uh, and the machine uh, needs to have its upgrade then the whole shebang can grind to halt. So be kind, think of others, do a good job, become part of history. I'll sign off with this last quote from John Ruddick. Thank you, Peter. That was a really informative talk. Um, so I'm going to go for the top question. Why are there usage restrictions on 100 plus year old data? Would there really be any problem with, with making this freely available? Um, um, not for the 100 year old data. Um, that's more a problem of it. It just hasn't been done. There are restrictions on making um, today's data available, for instance, because it gets used in commercial applications that, that people pay money for. Um, yet yeah, we're we're not very good on the open data front or even the open source front yet. So um, as I say, it's, it's a process. We're just um, finding out about this RSE thing, I think, at, at BGS. I'm trying to do more of that. Um, I'd like to do more of that, but I'm not always allowed or it's not always in the culture. Thank you. OK. Dealing with evolving file formats and standards must be a common theme for RSEs, certainly a big thing in bioinformatics on top of more generic trends like TSV, CVS, JSON, YAML, and yet another example of domain-specific knowledge which might be required to work in a new area. Uh, indeed. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, there's so, so there was all these, these 52 formats that I mentioned. Some of them are, are these more common formats um, and yet we're again work in progress but we'd like to unify that take that away um, the, the python package that i mentioned there before magpie um, the developer who's done that uh, has done a very good job of uh, take, taking that away so that you don't have to worry about the underlying data and the other thing that we're doing a lot of is is making these this stuff uh, available through modern APIs, so you don't, you don't care about that on your end, our end we have to care about. How often does the code get rewritten, or do you keep adding new code in new languages? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, well, we do we do a bit of both. Um, yeah, uh, there's some code that I'd like to be rewritten, but um, may never get around to it. Um, we are always adding new code um, at the moment. We, we're, we would like to have a common code base in Python because everybody, certainly everybody in this building, <laughs> it seems uses Python. Um, but yeah, we have this, this long legacy of stuff that isn't Python. And what, what do we do with it? Um, yeah, we, are, we haven't got enough people and enough time to convert it all. So kind of make do but yeah part of my job is to try and rationalize this into, into something that's going to be common and is going to be good for for people coming in and that that's my main um, thing is that uh, 
it's hard enough to employ uh, to get staff um, with necessary skills to come and work um, as we as there was in the earlier session we talked about that first thing today and um, how to get people to come in and work for salaries that are half what they might get elsewhere um, and to to be confronted with this stuff that they've never even heard of um, so I'd like to try and take that away and, and be able to keep the power science project on a more uh, even keel to what everyone else is doing. This data is clearly important. Is there any work to translate it so that we don't need to keep translators for all of the formats? Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, that's that's kind of why I mentioned these these different bodies that agree on these things. But it takes these these people. <laughs> you know, it's like the bigger the organisation, the longer it's going to take to formulate some some standard. Let's have a standard. Okay, uh, well, our standard needs to change because we've invented something else. Um, yeah, um, everyone would like to see everything consistent, but it's kind of point on get the, these things from the past get in your way so we still want to use that data it's in that format unless somebody comes along and does the job of turning it all into JSON then we're going to have to live with it. Is your funding still from contract work or do you seek e.g. UKRI funds? Yeah we get we get both um, we don't get that much from UKRI um, we're uh, lucky unlucky um, traditionally and um, don't blame me, but we do work for, um, we do a lot of contracts for oil industry and they pay pretty well. And um, that's for subsurface navigation of um, well drill holes because you can't see satellites under the North Sea. Um, so the, and they need to navigate really precisely when they're, when they're drilling these holes. So they pay for effectively live feeds of the magnetic uh, field to see where the drill gets going under the earth. So, um we we actually um we would rather be doing science but money's got to come from somewhere so we we take the the petroleum industry's dollar to do it at the moment um we're, we'll be moving away from that i don't know where that leads us for funding okay and are there any open source projects in fortran written and maintained still at bgs um, like I said earlier, we haven't got any open source projects, probably we should have. Um, we certainly have a lot of Fortran written and maintained, but um, that is going back in time. That's now um, the central part of the processing that we do, um, and that is tied into these commercial applications as well. Um, so we would be reluctant to be giving away that Fortran because it's a pretty niche market this and there are competitors so um we uh wouldn't necessarily want to give away maybe all of that and anyway it's not in a fit state uh to be given away um but yeah um good source is good in my book um but yeah we don't do enough of it does the offshore wind industry have any interest in your data um not but I know, of, uh, as I explained, the oil industry use it for for this particular case of navigating under the subsurface. I'm not sure of any other industries that that, that might do that. Um, I don't know if somebody knows more about the wind industry that uh, that they would need to know about geomagnetic data. Um, but if if you're in the wind industry out there and you <laughs> talk about us supplying energy magnetic data, then you can have to. Great, thank you. Another round of applause for Peter, please.